I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. The Pledge of Allegiance. It's a beautiful pledge that each of us has said too many times to count. But did we know what it meant? And if we did, did we mean what we said? Did we like to say it or enjoy saying it? Or did we think it's a pain to get up out of our chairs and put our hands over our hearts? Today I want to talk to you about America's downfall. Nope, I saw all those words spring into your mind. Disputes, deficit, nuclear weaponry, war. No, I don't want to talk about America's downfall in those terms, but I want to go to the core, possibly the reason that causes all the problems. I want to talk to you about America's downfall in morals. Imagine, if you will, a meadow, and on this meadow there lives light. Near the meadow there's a mountain, and in the mountain there's a cave, and in the cave there lives darkness. One day the darkness said to the light, let's get together so we can meet face to face, and the light liked this idea, so it went to the cave and entered inside. The darkness disappeared and reappeared on the meadow. They were both confused, but they decided to try one more time. The light left the cave and went back into the meadow. The darkness again disappeared and reappeared in the cave. You can probably guess the moral. Now, imagine the story again, only this time the meadow is America. The light is left. The morals that the United States of America were founded upon are no more. The darkness has come, not so that we can't bring it back, not completely come, but still it has come. We have tried to mix light and dark, and as can be seen by the story, it is impossible. There's no gray, no neutral, no middle of the road. To exemplify the changing of what has happened in America, one nation under God is one of the lines from the pledge, yet there's no mixing between church and state. In this country, we have such fundamental rights as freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of press, yet even these basic rights are infringed upon. There's a remarkable number and abundance of <clears throat> drugs and alcohol and a small number of those who don't use them. Our jails are overcrowded and still there's much crime. But is all this due to a loss of morals? Yes and no. One thing that happens to, to make us lose morals is that parents lose morals and then they exhibit these bad examples to their children who then lose their morals too. But the final question is whether America, but more specifically you and me, will return to those morals of good, ushering the light back in. Will we be able to say the Pledge of Allegiance knowing what it means and knowing that we mean it or not? On Thanksgiving of 1985, there was one fatal accident in San Diego. A motorcyclist had too much to drink, and while driving over the Coronado Bridge, he struck the bridge railing. This impact threw him over the bridge 100 feet below, where he fell onto a bus and died. This is only one of the many accidents that occur every day by drunk driving. Before, there weren't as many accidents as there is now, but the rates are increasing more and more day by day. Did you know that 75% of all road accidents are caused by drunk drivers and 50 of them die? Oh sure, it's fun to go out and party and have a blast, but people have to start realizing when inject injecting things into their body to make them see things, fall asleep, and perhaps go crazy is killing many people each day. It also really amazes me how when a drunk will get into a car thinking they can drive, and when getting into an accident, they, the drunk driver, never dies. The law should be a bit more stricter on these people. Perhaps we could limit the sales or cut the, the liquor in the beverages. And the Cadillacs of 1986 will have a breathalyzer in it. So if you are caught drunk driving more than once, you will have a breathalyzer installed in the cars. A breathalyzer is you must breathe into the car, and if there's any trace of alcohol in your breath, your car would not be able to start. 
I know of a 28-year-old who got arrested three times for drunk driving, and all he got was a ban on his license for a couple of years. So what does he care, any other person, getting drunk day after day and going out and killing an innocent person? People get drunk to relieve tension and to escape the world, but really are not. There are so many helpful people, like President Reagan and Michael Jackson put together a commercial to Michael Jackson's hit, Beat It. Stevie Wonder, who made a song, Don't Drive Drunk, which is on the movie The Woman in Red. There are so many commercials and advertisements and commercials and billboards stating, please do not drink and drive. There's one famous quote, friends do not let friends drive drunk. So there you have so many people to help, but why are there still an increasing rate of drunk drivers? I'm sure that's a question of many people, but no one really knows the answer except for the drunk themselves. There are also organizations like AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, which take the drunks into rehabilitations and give them many treatments. So don't be like the man on Thanksgiving and waste your life away by drinking and driving. Well, I live with snakes and lizards and other things that go bump in the night. And to me, every day is Halloween. Well, I've given up hiding and I've started to fight. Any time, any place, anywhere that I go, all the people seem to stop and stare. They say, why are you dressed like it's Halloween? You look so absurd. You look so obscene. If you have ever heard this song, then you know that it's about a boy who dresses like a freak. He, he dresses this way, trying to express a thought, and is laughed at every time he walks out on the street for the way he dresses. Can you picture a society composed solely of expressionless people? These, these somber people have no definite ideas of their own, at least not that they would ever dream of sharing. This, thank goodness, is not the society from which we come. People have always expressed themselves through their outer appearance. Variances in clothes, makeup, hairstyles, even the very colors that we wear, all help other members of our society to distinguish each of us as individuals. You have an identity, as have I, and every other person walking out on the streets. The obvious contrast is that some of us are far more blatant about expressing ourselves through, youth, through identification with a scene or group of people dressing a certain way, trying to express a common thought. For some of us, a growing scene that comes quickly to mind is punk rock. An example of another scene is mod. Some other scenes not normally thought of in this term are made up of the people who listen to heavy metal and soul. For the next few minutes, I'll be talking on something I feel strongly about the rightness of people creatively expressing themselves through their outer appearance. Creative expressionists do not only, are not only making a social or fashion statement, but more importantly, a political one. When you walk out on the street, you cannot see an idea. You don't read a person's mind. But if you look closely at what they're, how they are dressing, then maybe you can, you can see an idea or what they're trying to say. How many of us have ever thought how many of us have ever thought that the girl that you, that you made fun of today, you remember her, the one with the cone spikes, spikes sticking out of her head? Maybe she went home upset and crying because she is not accepted by society. She is expressing an idea, a belief that is too important for her to give up simply for a trivial personal reason for something such as not being accepted by society. How fair is it that someone with their hair cut died or styled irregularly, cannot get into Disneyland. You're saying, no, this is not true. It's unfair. Yes, it is true. Yes, it is unfair. I know of a person who couldn't get into Disneyland because his hair was sticking up on end. He couldn't get in until he put a hat on his head. How many of you feel this way? How, how do you people react towards something like this? How many, do you, can you relate to something? You of the older generation, do you even understand or care what the youth of America today is trying to say? In order to relate better, think back to the age of the flower children. They're a prime example of the first modern creative expressionists. By growing their hair long, wearing love beads, and wearing suede fringe, also, of course, carrying flowers, 
They wanted to show people that they were who they were. They were anti-military, anti-war. They wanted to show people that peace was the thing that they were trying to find, and everyone should be working together for peace. Flower children wanted America out of Vietnam, and they let everybody know it. In the late 1970s, a new scene came to light. This was made up of bands such as Generation X, The Clash, and The Sex Pistols. Susie and the Banshees followed in their wake in a softer version of the new politically aware generation. Punk was rebelling against the monarchy in England. When a person sees a punk walk down the streets these days, they laugh at this first class example of a creative expressionist. Punk is violent in itself and in its music, but the political message is for fairness to all and worldwide peace. Though many people still laugh at a punk these days, there are many more are becoming aware of its true message. In fact, punk is becoming quite a trend. The true punk will be angry when he first hears this, for he knows that poser is the trend, not the idea. In order to understand the term poser, one must first understand that the clothes or makeup or even the hairstyle does not make you a punk or flower child or anything. It's the ideas behind this, the clothes that make you what you are. If a person is expressing an idea but does not fully support that idea, then he is a poser, and no significance is usually attached to him as a creative expressionist. I say this is not so. A poser has something else to say. He is making a social statement. He is saying that he sees something wrong, and he's trying to correct it by rebelling against it. In the 80s, there is a growing political awareness. Many of the new bands are expressing this. Bands like U2 and Depeche Mode are two that have something to say. People who dress like them are saying that they support U2's strong desire for peace, especially that of lead singer Bono, or whatever the band their choice has to say. This is all, this is all being expressed in clothes, makeup, hairstyles, and other examples of outer appearance. In the 80s, we're the closest our society has ever come to equality between the sexes. Many of the people are dressing more androgynous. Women are dressing more businesslike and even casually masculine. Men, with their dawning that it is okay to show emotion, are dressing more feminine. They're going back to the old way of wearing makeup, earrings, rings, um, and even skirts or dresses. I know many men would never even consider wearing a skirt, but those that are secure in their masculinity, or lack of it, do. In fact, a good friend of mine does wear a skirt. He is not gay, and because someone wears a skirt, it has no say in if they are gay or not. My friend knows there is no one else like him, and he likes to express this through his use and non-use of makeup, variances in clothes, and wide array of earrings to fit his ears pierced nine times. It is difficult for me to express in words what I express every day in my clothes, that it is okay to be different as long as you know what you are doing and fully support it. It is hard for me to say what has been understood for so long between my friends and I, that you cannot help with you, what you feel, so a feeling cannot be wrong. The next step, if you have a strong feeling, is of course to definitely express it. My group of close friends do not label themselves. We wear the clothes that we like at random, listen to many different kinds of music, and have our own common set of ideals. <clears throat> Although we, don't, we do not label ourselves, other people sometimes call us mods or punks or just plain freaks. We, perhaps my words are best summed up by the feelings given by the words of the band ministry. Any time, any place, and I wear, anywhere that I go, all the people seem to stop and stare. They say, why are you dressed like it's Halloween? You look so absurd. You look so obscene. But they don't see that they're dealing with someone who's over the brink. And I dress this way just to keep them at bay, because Halloween is every day. Just imagine a young man in his late 20s or early 30s. Big, beautiful house, exotic sports car, more money than he knows what to do with. What do you think this person does for a living? Actor? Doctor? Lawyer? No, this person is a professional athlete. 
Today's professional athlete makes $50,000 in one month. Whereas 10 years ago, these people made $50,000 in one year, maybe. And not your superstars, but just your average Joe makes $50,000 in one month. Superstars maybe make twice that much. And what are these people really paid for? Catching some little round ball or hitting someone hard? We've all done these things in PE at one time or another. Play baseball, football, basketball. These people can just do it a little better. They can hit the ball farther or hit someone harder. Let's face it, these people are paid for something we've all done. And if they mess up, they don't care because they get paid because they have contracts. Contracts that pay them whether they play good or bad. If they play bad, they can play real bad. Doesn't matter, they get paid. But, this, but, this, but does this happen in real life? No. If you mess up on the job, or as I just did, you're out of there. What do these people really do anyway? For catching a little round ball, baseball players make almost half a grand a year average salary. Football, a little less, and basketball, a little more. Now, if you and I made this type of money, would you go out and spend it on drugs and stuff like that? You would think that by, by making all this money, these people could stay out of trouble. But no, these people are always getting arrested for drugs or dealing drugs or whatever. I mean, isn't it almost every day that you turn the TV on, hear that a professional athlete is getting arrested for drugs? And all these athletes sometimes neglect their fans. They refuse to sign autographs or they don't spend enough time with the community. And if they do this, the community will neglect them and they won't show up at the ball games. And if they don't show up at the ball games, the salaries, players, players' salaries go down the drain. That was nice. And all these players, they're really just out there having fun, joyful life, doing anything. Well, all of us are really working hard and earning a lot less. Take, for instance, policemen or firemen. These people work harder than athletes, but do not get any recognition or any money. All in all, if today's athletes get paid for playing child games, what should professional athletes, professional athletes, policemen and firemen get paid for playing the... Quote, a prejudice is the easiest thing in the world to acquire, but the hardest thing to get rid of, unquote. In the Webster Dictionary, the word prejudice means a bias or leaning, favorable or unfavorable judgment without reason, or for some reason without justice. In other words, it means to judge before knowing. Prejudice has existed since the beginning of time. It causes many, it causes many problems and produces nothing but adverse feelings, effects, results, and sometimes even war. Look at the Holocaust, the tragedy where a man named Adolf Hitler executed thousands and thousands of innocent Jewish citizens. Why? Because he believed that there was actually such a thing as a superior race, and he thought that the Jewish were subhuman. One of the better things that has come out of prejudice were the pilgrims. They were religiously discriminated against in England and couldn't express their religious beliefs or views. So they came over to the New World to start their own colony. This means that America was founded because of discrimination. There are many types of prejudice, ranging from judging on looks and appearance to discriminating against sex or race. Sexual discrimination and racism are the most common and the most stupid types of prejudice. People who believe that men are better than women have names. They are called male chauvinists. They treat women as objects and believe that the woman's place is in the home. Racism exists everywhere and is very dangerous. It's the basis for the killings in, in South Africa to the bombings in London. Our world is filled with millions of men and women of different races and religions. The ideal society should be able to get along without one group or another trying to claim superiority. Everyone is prejudiced in their own way, whether it be against people, new experiences, or even food. Say, for instance, you are at a Japanese restaurant eating delicious wedges of rice. Then someone comes up to you and tells you what you are actually eating, which is sushi, 
Layer it with dried seaweed, raw fish, broiled eel, octopus suction cups, and fish eggs. What would your reaction be? Would it be A, since you've always hated the idea of eating anything that might stick to your esophagus on the way down to your stomach, such as octopus suction cups, you immediately try to vomit? Or B, you drink mass quantities of sake, a Japanese wine made out of fermented rice in hopes of killing the fish eggs before they hatch inside of you. Or C, you eat the rest of your dinner anyway because you don't care what you eat as long as it tastes good and isn't toxic. Well, if you selected A, you are prejudiced and you wouldn't be a, a very appetizing or pleasant person to eat with. Now, if your choice was B, you'd be very drunk and you are very ignorant because the fish eggs are already dead and it wouldn't hatch inside of you anyway. Now, if you selected C, you are a very open-minded person with a lot going for you, or you're Japanese. Most likely, no one would choose any of the above. A lot of people would be repulsed at first, some would eat it, and some wouldn't. This is a prime example of judging something in a biased way just because it is different or unusual. People are like this too. They are too superficial and rely on appearance only. How can we stop this problem? Well, in order to solve this, we must figure out what causes it. Perhaps it starts at the home because if the parents feel a certain way towards someone or something, it usually reflects upon their children. They could have had a bad experience with someone and blamed it on the entire race, religion, or sex instead of that individual. Perhaps that is the best and possibly only way to get rid of prejudice is to judge people individually and not as a whole. If we want to get rid of the easiest thing in the world to acquire, we, we must acquire a taste for everyone in this world. And these children that you spit on as they try and change their worlds are immune to your consultations. They're quite aware of what they're going through. These lyrics from David Bowie's 1973 song, Changes, have become the battle cry for one of the most heard of unheard generations, the 80s teenager. Once again, the youth of America is being censored, cri criticized, and condemned as they were in the 50s. But with all the experience crammed into these years, the teenagers deserve a lot more respect than they get. Often called the best years of your lives, these times are being recognized as ones, one filled with hypocrisy. For example, you talk to your parents about college and they say, well, it's your future, you decide. And then they say, be home by 1230. You're left, you're left sitting there thinking, you know, is it my life and when can I decide? About 25% of all high school seniors have part-time jobs. Imagine going to school for about six hours a day and then going, going after school and working four hours. After you get home, you might have to do work around the house, and then you've got an hour, an hour to two hours of homework to do. This is another type of teenager that, that deserves a lot of respect. The burden of the new world is on, is on our heads. We must first cope with the threat of nuclear war. They also say that Halley's Comet may come crashing into the Earth. These are just things that we're going to have to learn to live with and try to rectify. Perhaps rather than spitting on our children in the future, we should learn to help them grow so they can handle the, the problems of the future better. Let's say you are a parent of three children. Of course, as a parent, you love them dearly. One day, you take them for a walk, and as you are crossing the street, a car screeches around the corner and hits one of your children. The child dies as the driver was drunk. This has happened to many families in the United States. Most of the drivers are let off on probation or with a warning. This lets them go off and do the same thing to another family. Of course, this next time, you will go to jail. But it has made another family miserable, took another person's life. It's unfair that one person must suffer severely while the one who causes suffering gets to live. <clears throat> there, sh I've, there should be stricter laws on drug drivers. Let's look at the other side of the story. He is a father of two and is happily married. One day he goes <clears throat> to have lunch with a couple of his friends. Usually they meet at, the, meet at a bar. They'll have lunch and order a couple of beers. Then someone offers to pay for a stronger drink. They all invite a great deal of alcohol. After a while, the bartender refuses to give them any more, and so they all leave in their cars. 
the father of two starts out at a regular speed, then feels he is going too slow and speeds up. Since he is drunk, he has no idea where he is going. He turns onto a street and sees a child going across, but, he cannot, but since he is going so fast, he cannot stop, and due to, his reflex, due to alcohol, his reflexes are slow. He hits the child. When he comes out of the car, people have already started coming out of their houses. He goes to the mother, but she is too upset and gets his hair hysterical as he approaches her. Of course, this man is sorry for what he did, but it was his fault. He shouldn't have drank so much, and he also should have called someone for a ride. A woman who went through the loss of one of her children because of a drunken driver started a group called MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. This has grown to be a large association. Another group now has been formed called SAD, Students Against Drunk Driving. This gives students like me, let students like me speak out against drunk drivers. So far, I've been talking about an incident where the victim was, was a pedestrian. There's also been incidents where the people in the car are drunk and the driver causes an accident that injures or kills the people inside the car as well as the pedestrians. SAD mostly covers this, since most of these incidents are caused by teenagers. I saw, <clears throat> I viewed a film last year about an incident like this. It was called The Last Prom. It was about two dates that went to a senior prom together. The boys brought alcohol into the dance and put it in their punch. Then beer was consumed in one of the boys' car. The boy hit a tree and one of the girls flew through the front window and was killed. The others were seriously injured. This should be shown more often in, other, in schools. It was very effective in my class. Most of the children vowed that they would never ride a car when the driver was drunk or drink and drive. About a month ago, Four students were driving around in the parking lot in our school. The car overturned a couple of times. The driver had t taken some drugs and also been drinking. One received internal injuries, another went to a coma, and the one was paralyzed from the neck down. The, the driver was not hurt in any way. Law enforcement on drunk drivers has improved. <coughs> before they would get a slap on the hand or a fine. Now they will get their license taken away for life if they're convicted two times in three years. Let's have stricter laws on drunk drivers before we grow up and have children. If we don't, we might have to suffer over the loss of one of our children because of a drunken driver. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. These are the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And in his speech, he's telling the people of the world that all nations, regardless of race, color, or nationality, that all men are the same. In South Africa, however, all men are not the same. For you see, the blacks are inferior to whites. The treatment of such discrimination, such as segregation, has forced the blacks to live in separate communities, to ride in the back of buses, to go to separate schools, and to worship in separate churches. But the worst part about being born black in South Africa is the, realiza the realization of growing up knowing that you will never be the same as proposedly the white child down the street. In South Africa, the blacks are trying to establish themselves by telling the government and the people of their nation that they are the same as supposedly the whites. The, the blacks are looking for a leader, Bishop Desmond Tutu, a man who purposely may be another Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., two men fighting for the rights of others. By showing their frustrations out onto the people and the government, the blacks have been rioting in stores and businesses and killings. In 1984, in December, 1,885 people have been killed up till now. 
It's a serious problem, segregation. The people want to know that they can be the same and they can go into the same places and do the same things, have the same privileges because they want to be equal. In Washington, D.C., they have been rioting, rioting not only with the fact where killings and bombings have to take place, but walking through the Washington Embassy, holding up signs and demonstrating, showing South Africa that they have their support. Famous people such as Coretta Scott King, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, Diana Ross, and many other famous stars. But not only famous people have been showing their support, but people who care about people, the other people, people who have problems, they're showing their support and their need to the blacks in South Africa. The blacks in South Africa, apartheid. Apartheid is showing that segregation is wrong and has developed into a concept of each racial subgroup becoming a nation in itself, forcing the blacks into their own group, another part of town, and forcing the whites into their own group, another part of town. The whites rule the majority of the government in South Africa. There is not a black official in office. There is no one in the government to show the blacks that they care, who give them rights. They don't have the freedom of speech or the freedom to write or the press, or to write or say anything they feel. They can't speak out as freely as we can. Segregation has taken us all over, here in the United States, through 1968 and beyond. But it has stopped. Discrimination has not, but segregation has. In South Africa, if they can stop segregation, that's what the blacks want, to be able to be as equal and share the same privileges. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream, and I have a dream also, that not only our free nation, but every nation on the face of this earth will see that each and every one of their people, even though they may be different colors or came, come from different places on the world, that each and every one of them are the same, because God made each and every one of us to be equal. Oh my God. At 7.47 on December 24th, I died. The accident occurred about 7.40 on the way to school. I couldn't feel anything, but I could see and share every, everything. The word among the people at the scene was that if I had been wearing my seatbelt, then I might have lived. I can't be dead. I mean, I can see you, and I can hear you. Can't anybody hear me? Then the paramedics declared that I would be classified as dead at the scene. I can't be dead. I just can't be. It isn't possible. Me? Dead? The next moment was the most unwanted and horrifying moment. They pulled the white sheet over my head. I could no longer see the blurred faces of the people at the crowd, nor the pain in the eyes of my father. My life was over, tragically. Did you know that car accidents kill about 55,800 people per year and keep ri keeps rising? Of these, 17,800 are between the ages of 15 and 24. Following close behind the younger age group are the people between the ages of 25 through 44. Let's ask ourselves why so many people are being killed in car accidents. I'll tell you why. Because people are one of many reasons, with intoxication being first in the long line, and carelessness following close behind, but falls to second place. Statistics say that children between the ages of 5 through 14 die accidental deaths of the, wait, 8,300 per year to be exact. 4,100 of these accidental deaths are the consequences of car accidents. Carelessness, what does it mean? Carelessness as defined by the American Heritage Dictionary as unconcerned, unmindful, inattentive, negligent, or inconsiderate. Unconcerned, that's a good definition for carelessness unconcerned about your life or your passengers' lives, unconcerned about the seatbelts placed in your car to save your life. People who don't wear their seatbelts now better get ready to start. Why? Because starting January 1st of 1986, a law will be passed 
dictating that people wear their seat belts or face heavy penalty. Seat belts are to use, not to look at. Don't say, I know I should wear it, but what's the use? We're all going to die someday anyways, right? Wrong. Why risk your life when there is a way to save it? The accidental deaths in children could be lowered if we, the older generation, would, or, would make or teach children to put their seatbelts on every time they get in a car and possibly to make or teach them to possibly even save their own lives. People who wear their seatbelts now are possibly thinking about their friends, their family, and maybe even the next day. These are the ones who aren't risking their lives. They aren't playing with the lingering pain of death. Death is nothing to smile at. My death was an unnecessary death, and I know that if I had a second chance to get in a car, that I would take the time to listen to the click of the seatbelt buckle around my waist, ready to prevent a senseless death. Picture this. Say you had a rough life. Nothing was going your way. You started as a child. You didn't have no money, or maybe you were kicked out from your parents, and you're on the streets. And right as, as you know, this time is, is going by slower and slow, quicker and quicker, and you're not getting any younger. And as you get older, you live on the streets. You're always searching for food, maybe in garbage cans. You just don't have no money. You sleep on the streets, you know, covered with papers or just some old blankets or some sorts. And what I'm trying to describe in this short summary was how many trans, what the life is of many transients. Right now, there's about th over thousands and thousands of tran transients just in the United States, partly in California and New York and all them kind of cities where most transients are. A uh, transient is, for slang, is maybe a bum or just someone who lives on the street. And many people think that transients are just mainly losers. But really, I don't think when they were born they wanted to be a loser. You know, I think they want, they had some goals in life. But maybe these times were rough and they just couldn't make it. And so they ended up being on the street. Right now, there's many things we're doing for trans or trying to do for transients because in San Diego if you notice there's a lot of homes for the, the transients to help them come in for a, for a couple of meals a day and for them to sleep but there's so many transients that they can't take in take in all of them at one time so just like only if like maybe about 40 or so can go in stay a couple nights and then another 40 comes in they keep on shifting but if you've noticed Right now, a lot of these houses are being torn down because of lack of money, and that is one of the biggest problems. Because not not no go the government or no, no no other officials are helping them, so they lack money. And so, as soon as they tear tear one house down, the transients are back on the streets again, and now they're sleeping on the street. They're back to where they started. And one one main source for helping the transients would probably be to give them more money. Because I think the government has to look at it through their point of view. Because, the, you know, if they, if you pitch really what you have, you have a home, you have, you know, a place to sleep, you have food, you know, you have money, you have parents who care for you, you know, you're not always on the streets, you're not looking for food or nothing. And you have a warm house to sleep in. But these transients, they don't have nothing. You see, they, they, have, to, they have to scavenge Right now, there are many things we're trying to do for the transients. The main things we are trying to do, one is to give them, trying to, we're, we're establishing more houses for them, or at least trying, there is about maybe four or five in San Diego right now, buildings which take in the transients, and what they do is they provide them with meals, and then uh, give them a place to sleep. But you see, there are so many transients, in, not only in San Diego, but in all over parts of the United States, that there's just too many to hold in these buildings and they can only hold so many. So what they do is they put them on shifts maybe and they like so many come in 
for like one day they each got like days they can come in to sleep and eat meals and then they have to go back out uh, back on the streets and going for food and you know looking for food and just being going back to the way they started and one big problem for the transients is lack of money see because these buildings as you notice one in San Diego just recently got torn down because it didn't have enough money and so the, the transients had to go back on the streets again and then they just you know were back to what they usually do and it's kinda bad for them because they're having something good and then it just got taken away from them because they didn't have enough money and I think the main people or sorts that could give money is the government because I think the uh, transient problem is maybe not as big but as the famine problem but maybe close enough to it since there's so many in the United States and to establish the government to try to give, give them this money is to put them in you know try to put themselves in the transient's point of view that is like to try to you know go see what they go through in life because they have a home they have their own family they have money you know they don't always have to be searching as a scavenger hunt for food and a place to sleep they have you know their home they have love and a family that cares for them the transients they don't have nothing so I think if the government can just put themselves in their their shoes and what they go through they might you know try to do something for them and that might you know give them the money that they need for the rest of the buildings to take in the transients. And if we do establish these buildings for taking in transients, you would notice that more and more they would become off the streets, you know, not being all crowded on the streets and getting in your way, you know. If you notice if you drive at night in downtown, you notice a lot of transients is piled up sleeping on the on the concrete. And they also they, they go to the bathroom in different building areas and all such a sorts of things. Another way we can try to help them is maybe to try to not only uh, establish more buildings, but also to try to search for jobs, you know, try to pr pr make them, provoke them to go to work, you know, try to make money on their own. And if we can do this, they can, you know, establish their own lives, you know, instead of falling, on, you know, on the backs of other people and the whole city. <clears throat> In the future, I think the best th thing for the transients is rehab rehab rehabilitation. That is to try to change the transient's way of thinking so they can establish themselves to become successful in life on their own. And if they can do this, then they can go on, out on their own and get their own job. And not only will it make them happy, but it will also make us happy. Because as, we, as you've seen, you would see them get off the street and then they won't, you know, be in the way, they won't be a burden on us. And, you know, when you see people, you know, start off from scratch and make it, you know, in the world, you kind of have a good feeling toward them. And that's that is why rehabilitation would help out, you know, greatly. Another way is to try to give to give the transients their, that certain motive that they want to work. Because if you notice a lot of transients, they don't really care, you know. They everybody thinks they want to be what they want to be. They don't try for nothing. They don't, you know, they don't do nothing. They just drag on with their lives. And if we can give them that certain motive, then they could try to go out and become successful as just like rehabilitation, as I stated before. And if this motivation becomes in them, then they can go out, you know, and really be motivated. And if they don't succeed, they can always try again. In this speech, what I'm trying to do is trying to make you think about what the transients go through. They go through a lot of harsh pain through their life, and people don't really think about them because they got problems of their own. And, you know, God created each person equally. That means each person has the same uh, equal opportunity to become successful in life. But sometimes people fall into a misfortunate happening which causes them to decline in life. To, you know, just become really like low lives or just become unsatisfactory. And I think it's up to the caring people or the people who made it in life to try to lend these people a helping hand so they can go out in society and try to start off a successful new life for themselves. One small yellow flower stands alone in an endless sea of green. 
lifting its tiny golden head to heaven and reflecting the overpowering beauty of nature. Its small yellow head bobs back and forth, bidding well to the world, and the world cries, weed. In the world of plants, this flower, the dandelion, is the epitome of all weeds. It is despised by all gardeners and wrenched from the warm earth by its roots to be destroyed. In the real world, the world of people, the elderly is synonymous with the dandelion. Just as the golden dandelion is seen as a dangerous weed, the elderly is seen as an unrespected person who is unneeded. There are three basic areas in which the elderly are biased against. The first one is when society th throws, throws the elderly into substandard nursing homes when their families become fed up with the burden of caring for them. In primitive societies, the elderly seen as an economic burden were killed. In effect, we are achieving the same thing. Throwing the elderly into nursing homes with unprofessional care is destroying their lives. As an example of a bad nursing home, take this, eastern, this nursing home in an eastern state. In this nursing home, the men's ward often is not clean. There is a thin, there is a thin film of urine in the aisle between, between the beds. The men, most of them walking barefoot, track the urine back from the bathroom. Fewer than half of this country's 23,000 nursing homes offer skilled nursing care. In a Chicago home, an investigative reporter taken on as a handyman was, was appointed chief administrator after 72 hours. A derelict in this same home was hired and in less than 24 hours was told to dispense medications, including narcotics. The second way in which the elderly are mistreated in is the way in which companies way in which companies hire the elderly. When the elderly when a, when a worker becomes a certain age, normally sixty five, he is forced to retire without any regard to his wishes or to whether he can still do his duties at work. The abilities of some el of some elderly will decrease, but the abilities of some will increase. Older workers are, have fewer accidents, are absent from work less often, and are generally superior in their quality of work, yet they are forced to retire when, when they reach that certain age. The third way that the elderly are discriminated against is, the, is that there is no, that there is a, there is a lack of good open-minded health care. Most doctors know virtually nothing about treating the elderly because there is nothing in medical books that, that tells about the aged. If the doctors are quick, to, are quick to say that an elderly person is senile without any further examination, they say that this is normal for his age. He's, he has, he's senile because he's so old. This is normal. But this isn't true. In some, in some cases, the elderly are not senile, but actually have some other disease, such as hydrocephalus or water on the brain. This disease can be, can be, um, can be fixed, and is much easier to, much easier than than senility. Age prejudice is the same as any other prejudice. It judges a person before he is given a chance to prove what he's really like. Some people say that that they're against prejudice in any form. But when they see it happen to an elderly person, they don't, they don't really realize that it is prejudice because they're so used to seeing it. And they don't think of any, anything of it. And they think that's normal. They say, he's an old man. Who cares? But he has feelings, too. There's no difference between a 25-year-old and a 70-year-old. They both have feelings, and they should both be respected. These problems, all these problems occur because of the failure of society to realize that the elderly are still human beings and that they should be respected. If society were to realize this and treat the elderly more fairly, then these problems would be eliminated. These problems can be eliminated if, if we can tell everyone that the elderly are not, are not dead. They are real, real people with real lives. And one small yellow flower stands alone in an endless sea of green, 
lifting its tiny golden head to heaven and reflecting the overpowering beauty of nature. Small yellow head bobs back and forth, bidding well to the world, and the world cries extraordinary. Hold your banner high, dandelion, we shall overcome. One day, a man, a very troubled man, leaves his home with camouflage fatigues and a few automatic weapons and tells his wife that he's going hunting humans. This man goes across the street to a local McDonald's and opens fire on an innocent group of people, killing 21 of them. Yes, this was known as the San Ysidro Massacre, and James Huberty was the man responsible for the largest massacre of people in the United States history. Did you know that half the families in the United States own guns? That's a lot of guns for a country that is said to be at peace with itself. Mo most people buy guns for sport, protection, and perhaps paranoia, they, like they were robbed before and they stood defenseless in their homes. Let's take a minute to describe the gun. Historians credit the Chinese with inventing gunpowder in the year 1200, and the gun was first used in 1250 in war, and its surf only purpose was to kill the enemy. Weapons serve only per one purpose, and that's to kill. That's why they're invented, and that's what they will always be used for. I'm sure they will go through many modifications in the future, but just to become more effective in their purpose to kill. Did you know that more people have died in America than have died in all the previous wars since the year 1900 by privately owned handguns? That's a lot of people when you, you consider that our country has been in many wars. Many um, killings are from the result of criminal activity and some are accidental. Perhaps, I'm sure you've all heard of cases where little kids are playing with the father's gun and the gun accidentally goes off, killing one of the brothers, shooting him in the head. But then again, many killings are as a result of criminal activity, um, such as robberies, um, holdups, stuff like that. And then again, many of them are family disputes. Perhaps there was a fight and there was a suicide, suicide or one of the family members kills somebody else, and stuff like that. Um, I'm not advocating the abolishment of guns, but rather I think that there should be some control on the sale of guns and so, so certain people will be able to buy guns and certain people won't. The National Rifle Association says that it's a constitutional right to own a gun, and in fact it is. It's the second article of the Constitution. It gives you the right to bear arms. But then again, many people believe that guns should be the sale of guns should be banned and altogether. Somewhere between these two extremes is um, a more positive and legal approach, gun control. Gun control laws are laws that prohibit alcoholics, drug addicts, people with criminal records, or people with, with that are mentally disturbed from owning handguns. These laws have proved to be very effective in the future and in the past, but then, it, but then again, there's something wrong somewhere. Because the guns always seem to end up in the hands of people that are incompetent and don't care for them. Perhaps when they bought the gun, they had a perfect record and they had no previous problems, but then in some time, something might have happened that triggered them to use the gun on somebody else. Guns, um, the one, one thing that's real bad about um, guns is that a lot of times people that are killed are innocent people that don't deserve to die, people that had just unfortunately had been in the path of a bullet and had gotten shot, such as an uh, incident in San Isidro, or children playing with guns, or just overall people just that are innocent and don't deserve to die, that are denied their chance to succeed in life. So, in conclusion, I think that the main solution for keeping guns are gun control laws, but first they have to be applied to their fullest extent to the law because something is wrong somewhere because the guns always seem to fall in the hands of people that are incompetent and they need to be in the hands of people that will care, that will care for them and treat them and will not abuse them.